Thank you, everyone, uh, for sticking around to the end of the workshop. It's been, I think, really stimulating, a lot of really interesting talks. And it's a lot of pressure on me now going last, as you guys are tired and coming on the, on the heels of so many great talks. Uh, so my lab is uh, a really a, a computational neuroscience lab. And we do uh, modeling and data analysis in close collaboration with experimentalists. And I'm going to tell you today about some work that we've been doing um, focused around neuroimaging, um, trying to bridge different levels for computational psychiatry applications from basically from molecules to behavior. And uh, so first, our funding sources, um, NIH, uh, Simons Foundation, and Blackthorn Therapeutics, for whom I consult. And I want to highlight a key collaborator, um, Alan Tichovich, a faculty at Yale, um, with whom all of these projects ha have uh, been in collaboration. Um, OK, so I just want to start with some of the kind of central questions that I think um, are really important questions for psychiatry that we should keep in mind as we're doing you know, computational research um, toward these ends. Um, really around kind of what are our end goals in terms of you know, therapies and therapeutics and where are kind of existing solutions and where are unmet needs. Um, and so one question is, you know, if we have multiple existing therapies and kind of current therapies for an indication, how do we match them to patients, right? And so there's been a lot of um, interesting kind of machine learning work in this literature recently, especially in the context of a major depressive disorder, where, you know, we have multiple treatments. The current practice is to start patients somewhat on trial and error until we find um, a good, a good uh, therapeutic regime for them. And um, if we can do better predictive modeling to be able to, you know, lessen that um, burden, there's a lot of room for improvement. But that's, again, a context in which we have existing kind of current therapies available to us. Um, you know, it's a very different situation, but a very pressing one in psychiatry is if we have a molecule, we have a drug, a CNS molecule, um, who do we give it to? What indications, what outcomes should it be applied to? And this is uh, the case right now where a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies are getting out of the CNS space, but there are a lot of FDA-approved CNS molecules which uh, need to be repurposed, right? And so there's a big challenge in saying, can we um, improve our chances of a successful clinical trial by better refining uh, which patients we should be tested against and which outcomes we should be applying it to. Um, and then finally, if we don't have a therapy at all, but we have a given symptom profile that we want to target, how can we gain insight into, into what may be um, candidate therapies for that? So I'm not going to necessarily answer these, but these are some of our kind of motivational questions. Um, and, you know, really, th this challenge of linking from the levels of, say, you know, uh, therapeutics, which act at the, you know, pharmaceutical molecular level all the way to symptom profiles, is this challenge of, you know, crossing levels of analysis, which I think we've seen multiple times in the workshop. Um, and this is also the, you know, the type of, of problem that computational modeling is really designed to do, right? To kind of cross levels, to explain phenomenon at some higher level in terms of a mechanism at a lower level, right? You know, but obviously this is a very challenging, daunting, multi-scale problem, and currently these kinds of mappings um, are unknown, right? And there obviously needs to be much more experimental and, I think, theoretical work um, to bridge these. Um, and, you know, this, uh, I think, you know, comes in when we have this challenge of, you know, moving forward towards individualized uh, therapeutics for psychiatry, um, where, you know, our current approach is uh, really challenged because our diagnosis and our treatments are not neurobiologically grounded, right? These are diagnosed behaviorally as syndromes based on symptom scales. Um, and, you know, part of the, the movement in terms of RDOC, for example, has been around this issue of, of patient heterogeneity, right? How do we kind of categorize the dimensions of symptom variation both within a diagnostic category and across categories? Um, and then the second obstacle is, is we don't have um, good ways to kind of link um, human disorders to underlying neurobiology, right, which is ultimately what we need to understand, for example, the effects of drugs on the brain. Um, and so, you know, what we'd like to do is be able to map all the way to the level of behavior. And there's you know, obviously much research in terms of um, linking that to brain mechanisms, a lot of neuroimaging research is uh, centered around that mapping between brain and behavior. Um, but ultimately, we need to link all the way to the level of uh, where molecules are acting in terms of receptors in the brain, right? And so one way we can look at that is, for example, by looking at the transcriptome 
of how the genes that are expressed that code for those receptors that are targeted by the drug. And what I'm going to show today is how we can kind of link across these levels um, via biophysically based, but somewhat simplified, uh, models of neural dynamics in which we can simulate the effects of pharmacology, um, that we can kind of test and validate them and constrain them in the context of pharmacological neuroimaging, um, and then ultimately link those to the brain circuits that are associated with uh, dimensions of symptoms. And so, you know, if this program of research is successful, ultimately what this could lead to is a, a real kind of, you know, framework for personalized treatments where um, a subject comes in, we assess them multimodally via uh, neuroimaging genetic behavioral assessment. Um, those data go into computational pipelines and engines. And then there are kind of different uses that this can be applied to. As I mentioned, one is for existing kind of current treatments, we can maybe optimize based on a predictive way uh, which therapeutic there will be most likely to respond to. Um, and we can also use that information for development of new therapeutics. So for example, designing a new clinical trial around a given molecule, being able to uh, do stratification of which patients should be enrolled based on which indications with which response outcomes um, based on this mapping from molecule to behavior via brain circuits. That's kind of the grand vision. Okay, um, what I'm going to focus on first is this issue of heterogeneity of two different kinds. Um, one, which I'll get to toward the end, is the heterogeneity of, uh, of patients and of symptom dimensions mapping onto brain circuits. And the other is the heterogeneity of the brain circuits themselves. You know, when we um, do, for example, clinical neuroimaging, we don't see homogeneous uniform effects across the entire brain. Similarly, when we do pharmacological neuroimaging, a drug does not affect the entire brain homogeneously. And so if we want to understand um, these effects mechanistically at the circuit and network level, we need to understand something about the heterogeneity of brain regions themselves. And so that's been the motivation of a lot of research in my lab recently. Um, and so one important axis of variation in, in cortex um, is the idea of, of a cortical hierarchy. This is kind of an organizing principle for cortical regions, and the idea is that there is uh, variation from low-level sensory processing through successive stages to more association kind of cognitive processing. Um, and we wanted to study this in the human brain, basically to drive a, a map that we could use for this. Um, and so we took as a candidate neuroimaging map um, this measure of a T1-weighted, T2-weighted map. This is a structural MRI map. Um, and for our purposes, it looked like an interesting kind of proxy measure of hierarchy because it has high values in primary sensory areas and lower values in association regions. This uh, is present homologously in the macaque monkey, and so you can see primary visual, somatosensory, auditory cortex has high values. You get the smooth gradation to lower values in association areas. And so this might be a way you can kind of parameterize hierarchical specialization um, across primate cortex. Um, to validate this, we can you know, look at specific regions in the human and, and monkey, for example, seeing that primary regions across different modalities have higher values than non-primary. In uh, the macaque, we have anatomically defined hierarchical levels. This is a la Feldman and Van Nessen, if you're familiar with this approach. Um, and we can quantitatively show that this non-invasive structural MRI measure um, is strongly negatively correlated with this anatom anatomically derived measure of hierarchy based on the uh, laminar projection patterns across cortical areas. And so you can see, for example, V1 here has the highest T1, T2 value and the, um, the lowest position on the hierarchy. And similarly, in human cortex, we can look across different functionally defined networks from resting state fMRI, um, and we can see that sensory regions have higher, uh, sensory networks have higher values than association. So here, across, you know, uh, structure, um, anatomical connectivity and functional connectivity, we see this robust relationship of this kind of inverse measure uh, with hierarchy. And so that kind of validates it as, as a measure. Um, so now we have a way to think about, um, in a smooth way across the entirety of cortex, uh, sensory to association gradient, hierarchical gradient. But what we ultimately want to get at, as I said, is ideas about the, the specialization of the microcircuitry itself. Um, what, how do we understand the heterogeneity of the local circuitry? And for that, we're going to leverage um, gene expression data from the Allen Human Brain Atlas. So this is uh, uh, mRNA microarray measurements from six postmortem brains. They sample across different cortical regions. 
um, we run that through our neuroimaging pipelines in order to derive kind of uh, group average maps. So this would be a map of the uh, level of gene expression for a given gene, and we have this across 10,000 or so genes in the atlas. And so now the logic is we're going to look at genes of interest, which we think reflect microcircuit specialization, um, and see to what de degree they correlate, have aligned topographies with this T1, T2 gradient, which is itself a proxy of cortical hierarchy. Um, and these data had previously be an been analyzed by the Allen Human Brain Al uh, Atlas team at the Allen Institute. And you can see here, for example, that you know, cortex is overall quite highly similar compared to other uh, cortical regions, such as cerebellum, thalamus, et cetera. And what we're going to be doing is characterizing the variation within cortex itself. Okay, so um, one of the, the key aspects of microcircuitry that we know vary across cortical regions is, uh, or is about cytoarchitecture, right? So um, and the neuro neuroanatomists will know that uh, early sensory areas have a very thick and well-defined layer four, and as you go up the cortical hierarchy, the laminar circuitry becomes more agranular and disgranular. Um, and uh, using this kind of ground truth anatomical data in the monkey, we show that we can actually predict that quite well by this non-invasive structural MRI measure. So what would we expect in the human? We can look at genes which are selectively expressed in different cortical layers. And so in this case, we can look at the, the density of genes which are expressed in layer four, and as predicted, we see a strong positive correlation, right? So high T1, T2 means a sensory region, low T1, T2 is more association, and so this means that the layer four genes decrease as we go up the cortical hierarchy. And so we can derive these uh, effective maps of the, of the different layer-specific genes and see that they differ in their uh, correlation with the T1, T2 map. And therefore, positive correlation means decreasing along the hierarchy, negative value means increasing along the hierarchy. Okay, so we can now look, take the same approach and go to other aspects of microcircuitry that may be important for, uh, for modeling and for understanding the effects of disease and pharmacology. So one thing that we're very interested in is the roles of different inhibitory interon subtypes. This is something that uh, Nancy's talk um, hit upon, that there are multiple interneuron subtypes which have distinct functional roles and have their own patterns of connectivity in terms of um, how they impact excitatory pyramidal neurons and their local interconnectivity. And in the monkey, we can look at the densities of these um, cell types. Um, so for example, the parvalbumin interneuron, which targets the, the soma of the pyramidal neuron, um, and we see that it has this positive correlation with T1, T2, which means that it has lower values and lower levels of expression in association regions relative to sensory. And in contrast, these dendrite targeting and interneuron targeting calretinin positive interneurons show an opposing gradient. And so what this suggests is that as you go up the cortical hierarchy, there's a large scale gradient of a transition between more uh, soma targeting inhibition to more dendrite targeting inhibition as you go from sensory to association regions. So that's in the monkey. If we go to the human and we look at the genes which code for those same calcium binding proteins, we see basically the same trends. And in general, we have the soma targeting parvalbumin interneuron showing an opposing hierarchical gradient as dendrite targeting markers. Um, we also are very interested in synaptic receptors, right? And so there are a couple ways that we can look at this in kind of ground truth anatomical data. Um, for one thing, we can look at the spines on pyramidal neurons. And this is thought to reflect kind of a microanatomical signature of local recurrent excitatory connections. Um, we can also look neurophysiologically. So for example, uh, there's been a study done in um, rat cortex where they saw that the time scale of excitatory currents um, were longer in prefrontal cortex compared to V1 visual cortex. And that was due to uh, differences in the NMDA receptor subunit, specifically NR2B, being higher in prefrontal cortex. So looking at the spine measure, um, in the monkey we see again this, this robust um, correlation with T1, T2 where association regions have more spines on pyramidal neurons than sensory regions. And so this would be important for computational modeling because this suggests that we would have stronger levels of recurrent connectivity in uh, say association prefrontal regions compared to sensory. Now if we go to the gene expression in the human, here I'm looking at the gene GRIN2B. That's the, the gene of this NR2B subunit of the NMDA receptor. And we see this negative gradient, right, which means stronger expression in association regions relative to sensory. And that's the same as was observed here in the rat. And so that can impact 
for example, plasticity and synaptic dynamics. And as we look across different inhibitory and excitatory receptors, we see that some have increasing correlations with hierarchy and some have decreasing gradients with hierarchy. And this is, I think, very important for computational psychiatry because this type of analysis gives us some insight into the differential effect of pharmacology, right? So Please. When, uh, when you say, when you are looking at the human case, yes. each point is the human? Each point is a brain region. Each point is a brain region? Yes. And uh, all the data is coming from one human? It's the uh, average of six humans. So the Allen uh, data set doesn't allow us to really look at individual differences, right. um, but we can assess how stable that topography is across those six individuals to see whether we can really interpret that gene or not. But so what? And this is yeah. like a, sorry. Please. Uh, is this like actually a G was hit? Um, so, let's see. I think that. Uh, you don't need to ask her now. Grint, Grint 2A is, is the G was hit for okay. schizophrenia. I know. Um, but we're thinking of this more from the spec perspective of, of, for example, pharmacological targets, right? So think about this, for example, right? So if we wanted to, say, specifically increase inhibition in association cortex relative to sensory cortex, if you had, for example, a hypothesis of cortical disinhibition in association regions, then this analysis would suggest that you would do that in a more efficacious way by targeting the alpha-5 subunit of the GABA-A receptor because it has stronger expression values in association cortex, whereas the alpha-1 subunit of the GABA-A receptor would not be a good way to target that because that has higher expression values in sensory regions. And so the idea is that, you know, we, you may think of pharmacology as kind of targeting the brain in a uniform, homogenous way, but this shows that we can actually kind of rationally achieve circuit level specificity by understanding the topography of the expression of the receptors that we're targeting. Yeah? So I mean, I missed it. I don't like non MR person. What is the reason? Did you use your explanation for why the T1 equated to T2 weight ratio is showing you different things that you hypothesis? Yeah. So for our purposes, we're taking it as a, a proxy measure of hierarchy, which we validate in the primate. Um, it t the T1-T2 value itself is thought to reflect a lo um, intracortical gray matter myelination. Um, and so that's I interesting in itself in terms of why you would want hierarchical specialization of, of, of myelination. Okay. So, that you're so these myelination differences are, you're, you're saying, uh, working themselves out this hierarchy? I, it correlates with hierarchy. What we see yeah. is a lot of things, yeah, still, exactly. I guess in my mind it's like why. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, and so what I showed you were kind of three important aspects of microcircuitry, right? Cytoarchitecture, architecture, interneuron densities, and uh, receptor um, densities. Um, but now we can kind of zoom out and look at the gene expression patterns as a whole, right? So here, if we just do PCA across the entire data set, we get the spatial map which maximally captures gene expression variants um, across genes. And you can see that it's quite low dimensional. It's kind of quasi 1D. So there's a single dominant pattern, and already kind of by eye, you can see that that is nicely correlated with our kind of proxy measure of hierarchy, right? Um, this holds across multiple gene sets, and so what this suggests is that, um, you know, like as I said, to kind of zeroth order, right? Cortex is different than thalamus, is different than cerebellum. The fir to first order, the way that cortical areas are specialized is following this hierarchical gradient reflected in the transcriptomics and captured by this non-invasive neuroimaging measure. And so we would suggest that these hierarchical gradients in, in kind of microscale um, properties, molecular properties really, may contribute to the functional specialization of these regions and potentially um, their vulnerability in, in disease. Um, and we can look at that you know, more directly by linking now the genes which show these hierarchical gradients two other kind of gene ontology analyses of, in terms of the biological processes of those genes. So for example, if we look at the uh, relative enrichments by a gene ontology enrichment analysis across different categories, what we find is that genes which show strong positive or negative gradients are preferentially enriched um, in, in multiple categories. Um, and we can also look at, at specific kind of disease-related genes. So for example, here I'm showing um, the genes APOE, which is uh, 
a gene strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease and SNCA strongly associated with Parkinson's. And both of these show strong negative correlations with T1-T2. That means higher expression levels in association regions. And these neurodegenerative disorders are thought to preferentially um, impact association networks. And so this suggests that one reason may, it may be is that because the risk genes themselves are preferentially expressed in those regions. Um, and if we look, this is now kind of a, um, a large analysis across multiple gene sets, and we see across multiple psychiatric disorders um, preferential enrichment um, specifically for the genes which show this negative correlation, and that means uh, higher expression in association networks. So this suggests that um, there may be a transcriptomic molecular basis to the, uh, the vulnerability of association networks in psychiatric and neurological disorders. Um, and this may be a way to kind of think about targeting them um, in therapeutics. Okay, so that's the, the gene expression. It just kind of establishes this, this hierarchical gradient as, as a dominant axis. Um, now we're gonna do is go to the large scale modeling of neural dynamics and see whether that axis actually um, improves our ability to capture empirical patterns of neural activity as measured by resting state fMRI. So here we're taking a very simplified model of neural dynamics in each brain region. Um, we just have a single excitatory inhibitory pool for each brain area as a firing rate model. Um, we embed that within a large scale network of the cortex. And um, our target here is the functional connectivity uh, from resting state fMRI in, in su healthy subjects in this study. Um, and we're gonna constrain the pattern of this connectivity via diffusion-weighted imaging. So this gives us our, our kind of best way to measure structural connectivity between brain regions in the human. That gives us a structural scaffold along which the brain areas interact. Um, due to the ongoing fluctuations in the network, we get a simulated functional connectivity. And then what we're gonna do is optimize these physiological synaptic parameters in the model to give us the best fit to the empirical. And here we're using multimodal data from the Human Connectome Project. Okay, and specifically we're gonna go after this, this issue of cortical heterogeneity related to cortical hierarchy, right? So we're simulating this network, we're simulating fast synaptic and uh, slow bold activity, getting our simulated functional connectivity, doing um, fitting to the empirical functional connectivity matrices. Um, and what we're gonna be contrasting is the prior kind of state of the art of a homogenous model. So the local synaptic connectivity is uniform across the brain, the ex local excitatory and recurrent synaptic strengths. And we're gonna contrast this with what we're gonna call a heterogeneous model, where we're now allowing this gradient of recurrent strengths across cortical regions, following this uh, cortical proxy measure of the T1, T2 map. Yeah. Sorry, I don't suppose it's weird, but have you built on the yeah, so this is, this is via the balloon Winkessel hemodynamic model. It effectively implements kind of a low pass filter, but it, it's an actual multi uh, variable dynamical system. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, again, we're starting from our empirical structural connectivity matrix. We have our empirical functional connectivity, right, which is just the, the Pearson correlation of the simulated time series. Um, and then we have the simulated functional connectivity for now the homogeneous model and the heterogeneous model that has this hierarchical gradient. And when we compare how well they fit, what we find is that we can substantially improve the fit to empirical functional connectivity um, when we uh, add in this axis of heterogeneity. So each dot here is a, an edge, is a, a pairwise functional connectivity edge. Um, and if we look at the goodness of fit, we see that by simulating neural dynamics, we can improve the fit from structural connectivity to the homogenous model, and then we similarly improve it as we now add this axis of heterogeneity. And we do so by having uh, a, a positive gradient of increasing recurrent strength um, up the cortical hierarchy. Okay, so um, you can ask the question, you know, is that, is that really the best gradient, right? Here I put in a single axis of heterogeneity, um, again, motivated by what we saw in terms of anatomy and transcriptomics, but there may be other, other axes, maybe others ones do better, right? So the way that we can test that is we can contrast our, our kind of a priori hierarchical heterogeneity map to now uh, random surrogate heterogeneity maps 
um, which are simulated to have random topographies, but constrained to fit the autocorrelation of our original map. Um, and then we can refit the model using these alternative heterogeneity maps. And what we find is, you know, because it's a more expressive model than the homogeneous model, it always fits better, but we get this gray distribution. We find out that our original hypothesized map is in the extreme tail. And actually, the degree to which these new surrogates improve the fit um, can be predicted by their similarity to the original map. So in other words, even if we hadn't had a good a priori hypothesis and gone in, in kind of a data-driven way, just with autocorrelated heterogeneity maps, we would have arrived at a very similar solution to the optimal. So this suggests that this truly is a, a preferred axis of heterogeneity. Um, okay, so one thing that we get out of for free in the model is that it, it's kind of multi-scale in term, temporal dynamics, right? We're fitting it using the slow, bold variable, but we also get simulated fast synaptic activity, right? And so we can look for a single local node model, what are the different dynamical regimes in kind of a parameter, uh, parameter space. And for the homogeneous model, every node you know, has the same local dynamics. But because we put in this heterogeneity, we end up spanning a line in the, uh, in the parameter space. And what this gives rise to is differential dynamics across the brain regions. Now there's the caveat that this is a very simplified node model, which needs to be expanded in multiple ways. But it does lead to the prediction that if we look at the power spectrum at these higher frequency time scales beyond what we can resolve with bold, there should be a hierarchical topography from sensory dissociation cortex. So to test that, we used resting state MEG data from the Human Connectome Project, um, which has this kind of spectrum. We get this alpha peak, uh, which we removed at the request of reviewers. Um, and so we are looking at now the, the, the relative broadband power spectrum. Um, and again, we can do a PCA analysis and extract a cortical topography of how uh, the dominant pattern of variation in, in the power spectrum differs across brain regions. We can do the same thing in our heterogeneous model um, and compare them, right? And so the kind of empirical result is that this empirically defined map of power spectral variation resting to MEG is correlated with the T1, T2 map. And because our heterogeneous model is parameterized according to that map, it also shows that, that, that pattern. So I think that this is uh, kind of proof of principle and really I think points a, a path forward in terms of model development because it shows that we may be able to use kind of multimodal data, maybe fMRI for the patterns of of correlations across brain regions, but say MEG or EEG, in order to build more interesting complex node models, say with multiple layers or multiple interneuron subtypes, which are constrained to the differential uh, spectral properties that we observe across brain regions and in different cortical states. So, um, I want to mention that one direction we're taking this is now to do fitting at the individual subject level, right? If ultimately we want to apply this to say heterogeneity across patients in a clinical sample, we want to be able to do the modeling at the individual subject level. And we're starting that now just in the uh, healthy HCP data set again. But you can see here just two uh, sample subjects which show you know, visually very different patterns of functional connectivity. Um, and when we fit the model at the individual subject level, we're able to capture some degree of that variation. Um, we can see that, you know, characterized across all subjects, each dot here is a subject, the degree to which they are their fit is improved by fitting at the individual subject versus the group level. Um, and the individual subject variation is actually an important target for future model development. Um, and so the way that we can think about doing that, here we do PCA across all of the functional connectivity matrices across subjects. And we can get here now the dominant patterns of functional connectivity variation across subjects. And so what we're doing now is trying to use these as targets for how we should extend the model with the goal that the model should have the expressivity to capture individual variation. So technically the way we can do that is look and say for our set of parameters, what is the, the subspace spanned when we, uh, when we uh, vary the parameter and to what degree these patterns of empirical variation lie within the subspace of model expressivity. Um, when we do that, and again, comparing this heterogeneous and homogeneous model, we see that both of them are able to capture the empirical PC1, the dominant pattern of variation. Um, but the heterogeneous model gives improvement specifically for capturing the second 
principal axis of variation um, in, in the healthy human functional connectivity. Neither capture PC3 very well, but by inspecting this pattern, you can see this kind of looks like functional networks. And so this gives us now a way to expand this. So here we introduce now network structured kind of background common drive, and then we can see that that specifically gives the network now the improvement to be able to fit PC3. So this gives us kind of a rational path forward of all the different ways you could extend the model. Um, we're interested in ex extending them in ways such that they can capture individual differences. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of tie these things back together. Um, so I showed the, the gene expression mapping, I showed the large scale modeling, ultimately we want to link these together for pharmacological and clinical applications, right? So the idea is we want to take a large scale model, um, simulate it you know, with some local microcircuit, um, and now for, say, a given target of pharmacology, say different NMDA receptors, these have different gradients across the brain. Um, if we want to think, simulate agonism or antagonism of them, we can go in and, based on our knowledge of microcircuitry and physiology, know, say, which cells and which synapses to target. And then the strength of that modulation can vary across the brain following the gene expression topography. And then simulate the large-scale dynamics and make some differential predictions for neuroimaging. Um, I'm going to show you one vignette where we've been able to do that in the context of pharmacological neuroimaging. So this is with collaborators in Switzerland where they're looking at resting state fMRI under LSD. Um, and so our measure here is going to be what we call global brain connectivity. This is simply the uh, mean of the functional connectivity matrix. So it just gives you a map, a value per region. And so we can compare, say, LSD to the placebo condition and see which brain regions change their strength of mean functional connectivity. And you can see here this large increase in visual cortex, specifically, potentially related to visual hallucinations under the drug. Um, the really unique thing about this data set, you know, LSD is thought to, it's they have kind of unclear in vivo pharmacology in humans in terms of serotonin or dopamine receptors. The uh, great thing about this data set is that they were able to completely block the behavioral and the neural effects of LSD with a more selective antagonist um, specifically of the 5-HT2A receptor. So they were using this drug, Catanserin, and if they pre-administer that, um, then it basically looks like the placebo condition. So this now gives us a very strong hypothesis that this neuroimaging map should be aligned with the gene which, of the receptor which we know is targeted by the drug. So again, to do that, we're gonna take this data from, uh, from subjects on, on drugs in Switzerland. We're gonna compare that to gene expression maps um, from these postmortem data from the Allen Institute. Um, we're gonna see how those topographies relate to each other um, across different kind of dopamine and serotonin candidate genes and kind of in line with what we know from the catanserin result, we find that the HTR2A gene has the strongest positive correlation with um, our neuroimaging map. And we can look at across the distribution of all genes in the Allen data set um, and we see that it's in the top few percent. So that's just an empirical, empirical comparison, right? That's the molecular all the way to the neuroimaging. Can we do better by simulating the neural dynamics in between? And so to do that, we're gonna take the same kind of large scale model of resting state functional connectivity that I showed you. We're now going to simulate locally the effect of uh, 5-HT2A agonism what, with what we know um, from physiology in terms of increasing neuronal gain. We're gonna fit whether that's differential onto excitatory inhibitory neurons. And then we're gonna constrain the strength of that gain modulation to follow the topography of the gene expression for HTR2A. And so we have two parameters to fit, the strength of the modulation and the EI specificity. What we find is that the maximal fit is at uh, a slight increase in the EI ratio, so a net increase in gain onto the uh, excitatory neurons, an increase in EI ratio. And then if we compare the empirical map topography to the model simulated, we do a pretty good job in terms of capturing that topography, and this is what that looks like. Um, and so in particular, we see that we can improve the fit relative from just going from molecule to neuroimaging by actually simulating the neural dynamics that are generating the type of signal that we're measuring empirically. So this kind of is proof of principle that we actually can kind of bridge from molecular targets to an actual impact on neuroimaging. Um, okay, so how much time do I have left? You have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. 
OK, so what I've shown you now is how we can kind of link from molecules and the effect of pharmacology up to brain circuits. Now, as I started the talk, what we were went to link all the way up to is patient heterogeneity, right? How does variation in symptom profiles, um, how can we kind of link that up with the effects of pharmacology? And so, therefore, we need to now meet in the middle. So we went from molecules to brain circuits and brain networks. Now we need to go from behavior and symptoms down to brain networks. Um, and so to do this, we took a large um, consortium data set. Uh, this is a BSNP, and this contains um, multiple patients across what we call kind of a psychosis spectrum disorder. So this includes uh, bipolar psychotic, schizoaffective, and schizophrenia. So there's a spectrum of patients. Um, we uh, bring in these publicly available data, process them, and then we're now going to look as our primary measure of the, at the neuroimaging level, this measure of GBC, right, this mean functional connectivity value. Um, and so we can now look across kind of a priori defined symptom categories, right? We can look at cognitive deficits. This is from the uh, Bax scale. And then we have PANS measures of positive, negative, and you know, general symptoms. Um, and you can see some, some variation, but especially across the clinical groups, um, they're not very separable, right, in terms of these kind of course measures. Um, and if we look now, uh, this is the correlation of individual items across the symptoms rating scales. Uh, within the patient population. This is throwing now all of the clinical patients together into a single group, and you can see that you know, all, many of these items are correlated, and that the cognitive scales measures are anti-correlated with the, uh, the, the PAN scales. So again, we can do dimensionality reduction on this. Here we're doing PCA um, to kind of derive general factors, and we get five, which end up being significant here, explain half the variance. Um, and so now the PCs in the space are different loadings onto different symptom rating scales. So this now redefines the axes of where subjects lie in symptom space away from the a priori defined of positive symptoms, negative, cognitive, general, onto now these new axes and we can kind of characterize and interpret um, what those profiles are. So now if we go and look in this space, um, we can now re-express the distributions of subjects along these PCs but you see that it doesn't really improve their separability in terms of the a priori diagnoses, right, of bipolar with psychosis, uh, schizoaffective, or schizophrenia. And we can actually kind of visualize the cloud, each dot here as a subject, in the principal component space. And what you, I want you to notice is, number one, that there doesn't really seem to be any good axis in which these diagnostic categories cleanly separate. But number two, that our kind of a priori axes of cognitive performance, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and general symptoms don't align with the natural axes of variation within the clinical sample, right? And so, you know, expressing or, you know, using as an indication degree of positive or negative symptoms is not choosing an axis along which natural variation of, of subjects lies. And so the question is, um, does this improve our ability to, to kind of understand the brain, right? Because again, it doesn't separate out subjects necessarily better. So the way that we can do that now is we are looking at our, our patient sample. We're going to look at the correlation for each brain region. So we're going to get a map. And the value at each brain region is going to be the correlation across subjects of the symptom scale value and this measure of GBC, this mean functional connectivity. And so when we do that for positive symptoms, right, this is a classic, this is like the defining symptom axis of, of these groups, uh, we don't really get much. There's not really a very strong um, or, or well-defined network topography when we do that. But when we go to these data-driven um, natural axes of variation in our data set, what we find is we get a much cleaner and stronger signal of, of, of revealing a cortical circuit, revealing that for these areas, for example, in orange, in yellow, um, this measure of GBC positively correlates with the strength of their loading along PC3. And the blue areas, it's a negative correlation. So it's a much cleaner identification of a brain circuit using these natural data-driven axes rather than a priori. Um, OK, so now that we have identified a map uh, you know, related to this, this symptom profile within the, the category, 
Um, now, again, we can go back to, say, gene expression and say now we have a map, and we want to relate that to maps of different, um, say, receptors, which we can target pharmacologically, right? And so we get, you know, uh, this is now the correlation. In gray, it's across all the genes, and here are very specific genes related to um, interneuron markers, so somatocytin versus parvalbumin, different GABA-A receptors, different serotonin receptors. And so this then gives us a way to think about for this, this map of symptom variation, how can we target the circuits that are altered in association with that symptom profile through alignment of the receptor gradients with that neuroimaging map? Um, we can also go in and kind of inspect this and see to what degree we can gain insights even at the individual level, right? So here are, are two patients um, within the BSIMP. Their behavioral profiles differ, right? This is their level across all the different behavioral scores, different categories. And you see we selected these because they load differently onto this behavioral PC3. So they have very opposite loadings onto that. And now we can go and look at their brain maps, their GBC values. Um, the black is the mean, is the zero. It's all, it's all kind of z-squared. So um, above, above the black line means more than average in the sub, and inside means lower. Um, so we can see that they have different neural topographies. Uh, in this analysis, we're using a restricted set of maps, identif regions as identified with the green, green regions, which are most predictive of brain behavior variation. And within those restricted parcels, um, we can show that the individual subjects then load differentially onto the neural map of that PC3 individual differences uh, topography, which I showed you on the previous slide. And then we can take that one step further and now compare that to, say, a different pharmacological map. So here, this is the map of the change in GBC under ketamine, an NBA receptor antagonist. And what you see here is this large increase in functional connectivity, preferential and association regions. Uh, relative to sensory. So there's again a hierarchical pattern of the change in connectivity under ketamine, which again suggests that this underlying differences in circuitry could contribute to that. Um, and what we find is that, you know, different subjects who have different symptom profiles will then be more similar or anti-similar to the map targeted by the drug. And therefore, this would predict that they may even have opposite kind of responses to the drug. And this may reveal an underlying cause of heterogeneity in response to pharmacology. Why does one subject respond well to a drug and another doesn't? Maybe because their you know, symptom profile relates to a, a, a different neural circuit alteration, which is then being you know, uh, uh, normalized through an alignment with the pharmacological map or not. And so you know, going back, to just to wrap up, you know, going back to this picture of how we can think to kind of link from the molecular to, to behavior, via this intermediate level of brain circuit and brain circuit dynamics and how that can impact the way that we um, deliver treatments and develop new treatments. Um, going back to those original questions I started with, right? If we have multiple current therapies, um, you know, we may be able to think about how this could also contribute to the optimization of delivery to each patient. Um, and you know, this is one I'm most interested in, that if we have a molecule, how can we repurpose it? Right? And the idea that we'd propose is start with the topography of that drug, simulate what the impact of that is, validate it with pharmacological neuroimaging, identify what are the circuits that are altered by that drug, and then think about linking that pattern of circuits to a pattern of behavioral symptom variation. And then you can think about, you know, for example, designing a clinical trial where you're using imaging or the behavioral profile associated with that imaging map to, say, select patients which may be optimally aligned for the brain circuits that you're targeting with the drug. Um, and then finally, if we don't have a therapy at all, but in instead we have a symptom and we've identified the brain circuit, this can give us um, neurobiological targets which we can think about targeting um, in future studies. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.